Speakers, brevity is the soul of a pat on the back today. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Douglas Nagy. I'm Deputy Commissioner for Strategy and Planning uh, within ATL DOT, and the parking, the on-street parking program for the city uh, falls under my area. Uh, so I, I know there was a request for, for information about the parking program. I tried to strike the right balance between you know, giving a breadth of information, but not going too deep that I put you all to sleep uh, with there. So if you have more inf questions or more information, we're happy uh, to provide it. Uh, but if we want to jump to the first slide, uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is, is kind of our roadmap on parking. Um, can we move the slide, please? Oh, right. oh, right here, my fault. Perfect. Um, so, so basically, we want, want to talk about what the situation was in 2016 uh, when we entered into this parking contract. Uh, what's the situation today and kind of what we're thinking about uh, for, for the next contract uh, in the iteration. Uh, so in parking enforcement, uh, we had limited city visibility into debates about parking tickets before. Uh, basically, it was either with the service provider or had to go to court. Um, so how do we improve that situation? We actually have a parking review team uh, within the city uh, to give uh, kind of a double check on top of the service vendor uh, that, that the ticket is, is good, try to reduce the workload to the courts. Uh, there and we also have access to uh, the photos of the violation so people say hey this happened da -da -da -da, and they'll pull it up uh, and you can actually see the photo of the signage the photo of the violation and the photo of the notice on the dashboard so a lot of times people say hey, I didn't get anything I'm like I have a photo of it on the windshield of your car get out of here you know um, but I think uh, one of the things we're looking for in terms of parking enforcement on the next contract or, or perhaps in other policy changes is how we can enforce more safety violations so this is you know you're blocking sight distance at an intersection blocking a fire hydrant blocking a bike lane uh, currently those have to be enforced by what's called a post certified officer uh, which means you're paying overtime to a police officer so it's a very expensive thing to enforce uh, so we're trying to work with law to see hey is there a way that we could get you know just regular parking enforcement folks to enforce that because that would allow us to enforce more uh, so that's one of the things we're looking at on parking enforcement but we've made a lot of progress there's still more to go on parking equipment and technology uh, back before 2016 I didn't live in Atlanta at the time so I'm referring <laughs> to, what, to what my folks told me was that you couldn't pay with the mobile app a lot of the pay stations were broken. Uh, we still had a lot of single space meters um, that, that were there. So as part of this contract, we got all new paid station, uh, pay stations. They were amortized over the course, over the first five years of the contract. So now those pay stations that you see out there, we own them as a city. Um, there's hardly any more single meters. And then a lot of payments are happening via mobile apps now. I know that's how I personally pay uh, for, for my parking. Um, one of the things we're looking at is could we yet better use technology for enforcement of loading zones? The big challenge there is not the technology side, it's on the state side of can you use automated enforcement to enforce loading zones? Um, and so we're trying to figure out, you know, what types of technology can we actually use? Does the state actually permit uh, on that? And then in terms of prioritizing safe streets, you often fi find this uh, on road design projects. Are we going to prioritize on-street parking? Or are we going to prioritize uh, a bike lane or, or perhaps a parklet or that sort of thing? In the past, uh, you know, CIDs and others that were advocating for safer streets, they would ask the city and the city would tell them no all the time, 100% rubber, you know, a stamp no. One of the things we're doing now is we've increased the amount of on-street paid parking in the city uh, so that we can actually give back uh, road space to bicyclists, to um, parklets, that sort of thing. And so we take them on a case-by-case -case basis. And we want to keep going that uh, forward uh, there because we want to you know, have the safest streets possible and balance you know, the need for revenue with the need for, for safe streets. So kind of in all three areas, we've made progress, uh, but we're still thinking about how do we become even better uh, on paid parking. Uh, so this is where our paid parking footprint is. The vast majority of it is in downtown and, and midtown, although there is some uh, uh, in other parts of the city. Um, but that, this is just what we're uh, talking about. We would love to expand paid parking to other parts of the city. So if you want to have that conversation, uh, it's not always the easiest to have, but there's a lot of benefits of, of, of paid parking, uh, and, and including you have people enforcing public order uh, all day long. Uh, so it creates a little bit more orderly uh, situation uh, in the curb. Then uh, one of the things I was talking about that's great about our current system is we have photos of the violations here. Uh, so this violator pictured here is actually your deputy commissioner who's speaking to you today. Uh, this was my car. <laughs> I, I ran into a city hall for a meeting uh, without paying uh, and they got me. Um, and so even your deputy commissioner that oversees parking can't get out of his parking tickets. Um, and it raises an important part. Um, one of the things I emphasize with, with our city staff, which is a team of five folks uh, in the parking area, is ethics. 
You know, we need to do what's the right thing, no matter who it is calling, whether it's, you know, Tyler Perry or, or you know, or, or someone on the city staff. We have to treat everyone equally and, and, and enforce. And so that's the great thing about the system is it just makes it very obvious to everyone uh, what's happening. And then if you get a ticket and you feel like you don't deserve it, there's three checks that you can go through. One is you report it to uh, ATL Plus and they can uh, void the ticket. Uh, two is uh, the, those come to our parking review team, all the appeals that, that ASP Plus looks at it and says uh, they, want to, they want to keep it. And third, you can always take it to court. Um, by far, most folks pay without fighting the citation. Like I was, out, I knew I was guilty when they sent me the ticket, <laughs> so, so I paid without doing the appeal process. Uh, but that middle one didn't exist before, so that's one of the things we're trying to to better manage. And then uh, one of the questions came up. Well, there was I heard the story about the Better Business Bureau a couple years ago, uh, and ATL Plus didn't get the best rating. Uh, so this is what you'll see as of I think last week is when I took this screenshot. Uh, that out of 158,000 citations, 20 complaints got to the Better Business Bureau. They responded to 100% of them in the last year, uh, and they got a C minus. I think if you're talked about how much you're loved by consumers as a parking ticket company, uh, and you're getting a C minus, that's probably as high as you could possibly get. It's not like other consumer products where you know people are happy about receiving the service uh, there. But one of the things is we want to make sure our vendors are, 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 are providing good and fair service to the people of Atlanta. Here are the financial numbers from the city's perspective. So this is how much uh, money flows to the city. The goal of this last contract was $7 million a year. Um, and you'll see that in the first couple years, we didn't hit 7 million. That was because we didn't have our contractually obligated 2,400 parking spaces available. Now we're well above that number. Um, and so we hit in year three over that and actually got additional revenue there. Then the pandemic hit, which kind of, which really put a burden on on street parking. People weren't commuting anymore. Uh, but the most complicating factor was in order to, that the last administration took a decision that said, in order to help restaurants, we want to stop enforcing on street paid parking so people can go and get meals at restaurants and keep our restaurant industry afloat. That was a policy decision, uh, but it forced us to kind of renegotiate the contract uh, that was there. That contract came back through through City Hall. So the way the, the contract currently works is you have your gross revenue number, you subtract the expenses of the vet service vendor, um, and then and then it's an 80-20 split. So the city gets 80% of the profit and the service vendor gets 20% of the profit. And this is for the first time we actually have visibility into the costs of the service vendor. So it actually allows us to better understand the program, better negotiate uh, as, the, as this next one comes up. The other thing you'll notice from this is that there's uh, you know, the revenue is not consistent year for year. So the main reason we want to extend the parking contract uh, one more year is to have revenues be up at that high level for one more year. And that gives us more leverage in the next next contract uh, to, to get, you know, uh, the service providers, all that are competing for our business uh, to give us a better deal. Uh, if that makes sense. If the revenues, if they can't bank on the revenues, they're gonna be very nervous about committing benefits to the city of Atlanta uh, in the next contract. So things that we're thinking about uh, for the next contract, this isn't an exhaustive list, it's just kind of a brainstorm, uh, is number one, no going back. We don't wanna go back to single paid meters. We don't wanna lose digital payments uh, via phone. Uh, two, we'd love to expand to other areas of the city. Um, there are areas that uh, have a lot of commercial demand and there's not turnover, so people can't get to the businesses uh, that are there and like the employees or someone else is parking all day. Pricing, I think, is a topic that we should discuss. We're, we're doing a benchmark of what are other cities charging per hour? Uh, should we do dynamic pricing? Like, you know, those four hours of the Falcons football game has a lot higher demand than other periods. Should we price that in or not? Are we capable <laughs> of, of doing dynamic pricing? Those types of questions. Safety, as I, as I mentioned, we really want to enforce the safety violations, parking in front of the hydrant, parking in the bike lane, because it's, it's very detrimental to safety uh, on our streets. And then we're also open to, to any suggestions. So that's the presentation I prepared. Um, hopefully that was just the right, right, right amount of information. Uh, but if you have other questions, we're, we're happy to answer them now or uh, produce additional documentation if you would like. Thank you, Mr. Nagy. Appreciate your uh, presentation. Um, I think we'd all be interested in the expansion conversation. I mean, I have a lot of paid spots in my district. It could probably be a lot more, frankly, given demand and how folks use them. So happy to have that conversation offline. Uh, and the appeals process works well. I have a lot of residents or guests who get ticketed, uh, including you, apparently. Uh, and um, I've, I've noticed the last six or 12 months, the appeals process seems to be uh, operating the way it should. And 
uh, in, improper tickets being rescinded in, in a pretty efficient way. Last, well, I have one question. That's um, I have received complaints about, I don't know if this is a technology integration problem or not, uh, folks who may have residential parking permits who have guests, mm -hmm. uh, once they input their guests into the system, because it's all virtual now, right? There's yep. no actual, there's no piece of paper yep. you stick on your dash as you used to, that the ATL Plus, or excuse me, the ATL Plus um, official is not getting notice that this car actually is a registered guest under residential mm -hmm. permit parking. Um, can you talk to how that is being smoothed out and are we, are we still having those problems? Perfect. So, so the main thing we want to do on residential parking permits is before you had to mail all this documentation into the city, it was really difficult, particularly during the pandemic, and we had, I thought, a customer service, I think a customer service problem on our side of getting residential parking permits out the door. Uh, so now you can do register 100% online uh, for those and it's based on your license plate. Then you also don't have to have a parking enforcement officer like snooping around, looking in the car to see, see if there's a sticker or not. Um, I know people are nervous about car thefts and that, so we wanna avoid people like peering into people's cars uh, unless necessary. Um, I, the idea behind the guest permit is that you could just enter their license plate in and automatically register. I, I think it's alarming uh, what you're saying that they're not, that's not getting to the enforcement agency. Um, so let me follow up with them and, and uh, make sure that's working. Anytime you launch a new digital service, there's oftentimes bugs in it. Um, but I think it's better to work out the bugs of the new digital service as opposed to go back to months of delays of people getting their parking permit. Great. Thank you. Mr. Wan. I'll make this brief. I mean, I, a part of the other conversation I'd like to have with y'all when, when in, in light of the next cycle is there is also not just the safety factor around hydrants, but also when events are happening, um, that there are parking restrictions in place for very specific reasons, a lot of times for emergency vehicles to be able to get down street. Yeah. So um, I know that we've had a little bit of trouble getting responsiveness in terms of, hey, anticipating there is an event coming up, a game, a festival. Um, so we need to have ATL Plus kind of ready on the ready mm -hmm. um, to be able to support our communities that are impacted the most by those. So let's just have that co follow up conversation if yep. you can, Mr. Nagy. Yeah, I think we could include something like surge staffing for, for high demand periods. Great. Any other questions? Mr. Amos. I'm sorry. Amos, then Lewis. Jess, I, I don't know if my colleague Juan knew it was coming, but you should have. <laughs> Even if you look at your map, Yep. That central spine of 75, 85 down the city, but right to the left of it is Northside Drive, which mm -hmm. has no dots, which means doing Ben's games where I can't even get out my neighborhood. Yep. Um, there's no enforcement. I can't tell you the last, I can't even tell you the color of ATL plus car. <laughs> um, so special yep. events, which seems like an easy time. Yep. Because trust me, people are parked throughout Vine City. It sounds like they'll get a there. return on their, so, their, yeah, their staff I mean, time. <laughs> we, we could get ge yeah. revenue generated, but there's no one out there enforcing. Zone 1 is doing their regular Zone 1 business. And if we have this company in place that my neighbors and constituents feels as if they should be standing in the gap for them and yeah. no one is there, yeah. then we're, we have plenty of questions. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think with a lot of it, we want to have non-sworn officers enforced because at a big event, I want the sworn officers focused on safety and terrorism and all those things, and we could have the SP Plus folks enforced. I think that's a wonderful idea. Well, if you could turn around at the airport, ATL enforcement, we approve to direct traffic. So if we can approve <laughs> to get them enforcement ability yeah. as well and hire some people at the airport to come out and help us, help me get out my neighborhood, I support that as well. So Perfect. let's start Thank some intergovernmental department conversations. Perfect. Thank Great. you. Uh, Mr. Lewis, and then we're going to uh, bring Mr. Greenwood back from purgatory to hear from Council President <laughs> Shipman. And I, and I think my, a lot of my issues were uh, answered uh, because a good public-private partnerships, they've been reaching out as much as possible, even as much as this morning uh, before the meeting. Uh, but to them, uh, similar to folks I've talked to in my community, the cash portion, a lot of my folks, uh, they're telling me that when they try to put their money in, the money, the machine isn't accepting the money. And so that's a technology glitch, it seems like, that's going on. So I want them to uh, make sure they focus and always remember uh, that people have cash in Atlanta. This is a, uh, we're a big city, but it's still a small town. Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks are carrying around cash uh, on us. So please have them look into that.
Okay. And if you have reports of specifically where it is, we can make sure those machines get double checked. We, we know the area is in uh, Councilmember Faruqi's area and uh, Councilmember <laughs> Amos's area. It ain't in my area. But uh, the, uh, the, they're having an issue with, you know, the, 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 the I know at one point in Atlanta, our machines got to where they would accept some dollars that were a little crinkled. And so I, it, I've come to the uh, conclusion that these machines, they want the most crisp dollar you can put in there because they really prefer cards and they really prefer uh, phones. And so I want to not forget the folks in Atlanta who may have a dollar that was just given to them from somewhere. So, Good point. Uh, don't leave just yet. Councilor Rosen Shipman has one question for you. Okay. Uh, during the pandemic, there was a move to take some parking spots that were on the street and for restaurants or pubs to use those as dining options. There was a process by which uh, I understand it was for my time, but they could basically apply for that. Is that process still open? Are we still allowing businesses to, uh, to apply to use parking on street parking spots instead for their um, business? Yeah, so city planning manage that. I believe it's still still available um, so we'd have to double check with city planning because they were the ones managing the those minutes. so I think I think we should I I have gotten I have gotten some inquiries and it seems as if that might not still be okay. or it's not perceived that it's still available but I do think you know if we're talking about optimizing parking there's charging for it but there's also sometimes using it for something yeah. else yeah I, I think we have two concern two, two <laughs> things we think about when we think about giving up a parking space one is we need to keep our total number of parking spaces in compliance and so we've increased you know, several hundred above the limit. So if you ask us financially, can we give up a couple parking spots for a restaurant? For sure. Second is uh, safety is, is, you know, on certain roads, you know, North Side Drive, I wouldn't want to, to have a, a, a one there. Um, so we just want to make sure when, whichever restaurant's permitting that that's in safe conditions, because uh, I've seen some horrific videos from New York City and other places of, of just cars barreling into into these. And so I, I know the ones that exist, there's one in front of Dancing Goat's Coffee by my house uh, that's still out there on the street, uh, but it has protective barriers around it and it's also not a high speed street. So safety is always the, the first thing we look at. Okay. Oh. And just one last question and comment. Um, although Hi. my colleague Jason Dozier is not here, we share um, Castleberry. And I know you're very familiar with the parking issues over there at Castleberry. Yep. So I just want to put their name out there in the energy of the room. So as mm -hmm. we're fixing these issues, we can make sure that Vine City and Castleberry and the places around the bins are well taken care of. We're, we're trying to cook the right recipe for Castleberry Hill, but not everyone likes, not everyone agrees on what taste they want. So, so it's not the, we're, we're, we're working on it. I actually was talking to Councilman Dozier this week about that specific area. Thank you, Deputy Thank Commissioner. You. Appreciate it. Uh, CEO Greenwood. Uh, Thank you for uh, being patient with us and returning. Uh, this line of questioning is limited to Council President Shipman, so we can get to our legislative items of the day. Council President Shipman, the floor is yours. Thank you. I appreciate it, Mr. Chair. Thank you, CEO Greenwood, for coming back. I apologize for having to step out for a moment. Um, I do have questions around the bus decisions and the bus spending and then around the project list. I'll take them in that order. Um, I think my colleague, Councilmember Lewis, referenced a 2018 letter to uh, then Mayor uh, Bottoms signed by CEO Parker, as well as uh, Atlanta appointee board members, uh, Robert Ash, Ryan Glover, and Roderick Edmond, that had outlined the anticipated spending of the anticipated $2.4 billion. In that, $238 million for improvements to the current bus system. If you take the $181 million, which your presentation uh, showcases, has been more MARTA dollars spent on bus, that's 38.7%. So five years in, we've gone from a letter from the CEO at the time that said we were going to spend roughly 
10% on bus to spending 38% on bus. So my question is, how did that not trigger a Section 5 uh, formal change to the project list? Because as I read the IGA, that seems to be quite material. The history of these conversations, I believe that that was the intention in 2019 when City of Atlanta and MARTA said, let's revisit the, the level of bus service. Um, I do know that um, from a, in, internally, from a, a service planning perspective, we had uh, prepared documents uh, about how we could pull back on the level of bus service. Everyone was on board when we were adding, and you know, we, we, we were happy to boast about the ads, but when it was time to pull back, we were very cautious about the idea of basically taking away what we had already given to the public. That said, City of Atlanta said, let's hold on, let's do this bus network redesign, and let's address it all in one tranche. And so that's what's happened. Is, is there a document like the 2018 letter that codified that uh, significant change that you've been able to find? I'll, I'll look for it. That's, uh, that's a great question. Um, th that's, the, that's the course of conversation, but I'll look uh, for a document that codifies that. Um, if I, you highlighted the revenue service hours changes early on in the program that because of the investments that had been made. But if I, again, am reading the December 2022 update, um, that has actually been decreasing over time. The, uh, the bus service hours have been decreasing over time, if I read that correctly. And I'm adding, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but as I look at that, again, the December 2022 update, I'm adding together the um, revenue hours for bus and para together. Bus and para. Para, yep. Um, and basically, it, it shows that in FY19, it was um, 27, tw roughly 2730, and FY20, it was 2800, FY21, 2450, FY22, 2300. So, one, is it true that bus service hours or revenue service hours have been going down over the last few fiscal years? The, the scheduled amount of hours has not changed, but the actual hours has gone down coincident with the lack of resources. Right, and we've talked about that before. We've, right. had, we've had labor issues, so the schedules remain the same, but the actual revenue service hours have gone down. Correct. Um, so we've continued, and, and we've seen that the more MARTA dollars for bus have gone down. That's in your chart that you showcased. Yes. Mm -hmm. But we're still spending well above the 10% the level, right? So if I look, so one, in a very clear question, are we only able to do nine projects because of the overinvestment in the bus enhancements? I, I would say no. You could choose any of those projects and say, you know, but for this project, we would be able to afford more in tranche two. The fact that we're choosing bus, um, yeah, I guess I, I, we could. If mathematically, if we didn't spend that money, then perhaps there would be enough to support yet another project. I, I don't, it depends on the cost of the other projects. But the fact is, you know, we said we were going to do bus service, and that was the first thing we did immediately out of the gate, and we continue to add on to it. So uh, your, your question's fair. Had we not done that, there may have been more money for another project. Um, a, a, a related question. You've, you've boasted about, and your financials have shown that you've run a surplus at MARTA for the last <laughs> several years. Would you have been able to run a surplus without the increased investment of more MARTA dollars into enhanced bus service or ask more more bluntly have
and or sales tax and or federal funds. But obviously this is the mix that you decided on. Well, th 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 there were some policy decisions that were made, how to fund more MARTA enhanced per service and the funding was consistent with that. But it, just to be clear for the public, according to the IGA, it very clearly states that the ultimate authority over the more MARTA program is the MARTA board. Ultimately, the decision on the mix of funding more MARTA and specifically the bus enhancements is MARTA's decision, correct? We did use the federal funds to support overall MARTA operations. But it's so, your decision. Yeah. It's MARTA's decision. It's not the city's decision per the IGA, correct? So Peter Andrews, Chief Legal Counsel. Just so let's let's get back to being all on the same page, right? Uh, going back to your Section 5 question about the program changes. So when the JPLG, which was made up of the City of Atlanta and MARTA, decided to narrow down the list and put in the enhanced bus service, that was prior to the 2020 IGA you're looking at and referencing regarding program changes. That was not signed until 2020. So that, that, that's why there was no program change or significant change process that was implemented because the city of Atlanta and MARTA jointly with other stakeholders including ARC and others determined that the enhanced bus service was important to roll out from day one. Uh, in fact, several of us can even tell you that the city council and the mayor who was in place when the referendum passed thought that getting bus service out within 30 days was so important that it did so without any contracts in place. MARTA went ahead and started funding that with the core penny to then get reimbursed when the half penny started rolling in because that's that was the decision that was made jointly. As far as the question about who makes the final decisions, the final decision on transit, yes, does lie with MARTA. As far as how the money was spent, because the money was, was again, as Raj was saying, was approved and agreed to by the joint committee of the city and MARTA, that is what the, the funding went to. Money is fungible. We can move it from one pot to the next in many cases. But to answer the question very frankly, no, no more MARTA money was used to, to pad our books. It went to more MARTA projects and more MARTA projects only. <clears throat> but just to be clear, it didn't ha the, this level of spending on bus enhancements did, ha did not have to be supported by more MARTA money. In fact, there's a more MARTA surplus that is in the projections for going forward. So clearly you've, MARTA, I don't mean you, but MARTA has made decisions to hold back some of the more MARTA money and not spend it. You could have held back more of the more MARTA money related to bus enhancements and spent other sources, but this is the mix that we have. So the, the answer, I guess, is, you know, should we have spent money that we could have used for the entire system, including those portions of it in Fulton, DeKalb, in to benefit the city of Atlanta instead of to provide the service that they asked for instead of using the money that was programmed by the half penny. And that's where we run into the issue is that we have to treat it as an entire system. And so we can't take from one pocket and put it in the other pocket without having an explanation. I have a slightly different perspective. The decision was made to support bus operations in Atlanta at the level of 37%. Uh, from more MARTA funds. So that, that is an extraordinarily high and at the beginning of the program an unanticipated level and you've already said that there's probably a, a more efficient way I believe was your, was your statement to spend that money. So I'm just trying to make sure we understand how we got here and specifically how we got to nine projects and I would just say Mr. Chair on the record for me, it is clear that the decisions of the past, however they were made, I would love to see a piece of paper around them if it exists, but is constraining the number of projects we can do. Maybe that is correct, maybe that is not correct, but we have definitely traded some capital projects for bus enhancements at a level that was not anticipated in 2018. So uh, that's my statement, that's, that's not a question. Um, let me ask one more question on this. Has there been any discussion with the administration or with any, any uh, of the PGC or the PMT around any clawback or any um, uh, additional deposit back into more MARTA capital planning for the spending level that we've seen on the bus enhancements previously? 
Um, in, in terms of, and I, I think I said this earlier, we are in conversation with the mayor's office about uh, right-sizing that kind of consumption on the bus service plan, whether or not it is retroactive or, or um, recompensatory recompen in terms of how much we spend going forward. Those decisions are yet to be made, so it's a little early for me to tell you exactly how we're going to make that work. Okay. Uh, let's move to the project list. Um, the project list that's outlined here in your presentation, I'll be referring mostly to the financial model just for ease. Um, has that been a, a formally approved by uh, the, per the IGA? No, for formal approval, we will have to bring that to the MARTA board. The, the project list itself, in terms of the nine projects on there, that's gone through the, the program governance committee, but we still have to go through the, uh, the MARTA board. And has the program governance committee formally approved that list? Yes, the form, the, formally the program governance committee has said we are we're in support of this list. I, I believe that there's, um, and, and let me just qualify that because the program governance committee said let's talk more about what engagement looks like um, and you know to what extent are we going to uh, entertain changes from the public. So that was, um, that was the one caveat in terms of that. But as we move forward, the list in and of itself, the program governance committee is supportive of that list. When I look at the list and I look at uh, the spreadsheet and I see the awarded federal and state funds $500 million um, total line item for this time period, correct? Sounds right. And that is, um, that is all anticipated going forward because this is FY23. So none of that 500 has been, been uh, acquired yet. Is that correct? Uh, Raj, I'm going to just check with you. Some of it has been appropriated? Yeah. So I think some of it has, some of it is in there. What level has already been has already been appropriated? So the 25 million that I spoke of earlier uh, for five points transformation, um, we are also uh, within some of the reports that you've been given. If you look at the December 2022 report, there is actually an accounting of the federal funds that we've taken against each of the capital projects. So, for example, on Campbellton Road, because we have been approved to. Uh, enter the CIG program, we can be reimbursed for some of those funds before we actually formally apply uh, to get the federal funds under the CIG program. Yeah, I see eight, I see I see the 8.4 million in the December 22. Is there is there a higher level of funding than the 8.4 million federal? The committed federal funding? Yeah, it, it should be expended. I think 2.6 million we've taken in so far. Oh, I see. Yeah, there's 2.5. I see on the capital. Yes. And I should note that the state funds are actually paid up front and we draw down off of those. Okay. So roughly maybe 50 million of the 500 million or so has been acquired. I mean, sort of a rough. In terms of committed? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So we have 450 million to go in order to make this spreadsheet work. Are those 450 million spread across all the projects or are they specifically aimed at one or two projects? Or said differently, if we don't get the 450, which project comes off the list? Those are for specific projects um, because again, the CIG program is a competitive program and we're competing across the country uh, for those funds. So those are allocated to Campbellton Road uh, was one that we are, obviously we've entered the CIG program and the second one was for Clifton. So Clifton and Campbellton uh, need the 450 million or some portion of it to come through in order to reach the full fund. That is correct under the current model. Under the current model. Yep. Under the current model we're looking at. Is there, is, is, do you know the split between the two? Is one more heavily dependent on the federal than the other? Yes. Um, the Clifton Corridor project is more, thank you. I'm doing it off, <laughs> off my, uh, my mind. Um, so the, Clif the Clifton project, we do intend to go for what's called a new starts grant as opposed to a small starts. And they both have different uh, capacity in terms of how they fund projects. So the, under a small starts, which is the, the size of the project that Campbellton is, uh, we can um, get up to 150 million. And under a, a new starts program, we can get up to, I think it's 50% of the project. Okay, so is it fair to say that Clifton is at risk if federal money does not come through? That's fair to say as well. Yeah. Is it fair to say that Campbellton 
is at risk if federal money does not come through. That's fair to say. And I will say we would have to go back and relook at our model, right? And relook at the project list and make adjustments as needed. Okay. So in essence, we have the model basically says we've got seven projects that are that are fairly funded on their own, and we've got two projects that we really need the federal funds to come through on. Is that a fair characterization? That's fair. I would also offer we continue to look for opportunities to go for some of the smaller grants, um, so to speak. So, you know, I'll just use five points as an example. If we are able to chase additional bus and bus facilities grants for some of the connections that we're trying to make, we're looking at all those opportunities to, to chase the federal funds. Good. Um, the bonds that are anticipated, what's the total bond uh, uh, level that we anticipate across those years? It's approximately 645 million. And what's the total interest that we anticipate? Over the life of them for all, we are using an average interest rate of 4% on that. 4%? And they're 30 year bonds, right? Is that correct? Most of them are 30 year bonds. Any debt issued after 2027 is truncated by a year or two because the sales because tax the sunset the, in 2057. Um, when, when we look at this revenue line, capital sales tax and operating sales tax expansion percentage only, what, is that, what does that mean in layman's terms? This is just a portion of the sales tax we're using for capital. In other words, there is a higher level of uh, sales tax generated from half a penny. Portion of that goes to enhanced bus service, which was to bus service, about, right? Uh, as well as uh, streetcar operations. It's what is allocated for capital. So, what's so is the level of bus enhancement and bus service supported by more Marta on this spreadsheet that we have? No, it's not on this spreadsheet. No. Do we have any anticipated uh, level? that we think it's, that it is going to, to be going forward? Uh, for 23, we expect roughly about $90 million collected from the half a penny sales tax. So as you can see from this, uh, about 55 of which will go to projects. The rest would go to bus service and streetcar. To bus service and streetcar. So 90 minus the 55, <coughs> roughly. So 45 million going to the others. That's a, right. That's a lot. Hills Rose Sherman, how much, how much more do you have? I've got a couple questions and okay. then I'm done. Yeah, we'd like to get on with the legislative part. Yeah. Um, so I went ahead and built a model out for the rest of the term through 56 to try to understand your bonding capacity going forward and how many projects you would have. Because my concern here is that we are using an enormous amount of the money from the sales tax to bond to do these nine and that we are then counting on operations going forward to really be the ability to bond later. So my question is, how much do we think that we actually have in additional bonding capacity starting in 2035? I will tell you my number, according to your numbers and using your 4.8% CAGR that you're using. 4%. Four, four no, 4.8% is what you're using on the revenues. You're not using four, you're using 4.8. If you look at the CAGR on, on the revenue growth on the top line, it's 4.8, correct? Right. I, I, I thought yep. you were mentioning the nope. in interest cost. Yep. Okay. The 4.8 yep. is the CAGR. So uh, continuing all those, looks to me like you got about a billion dollars of bonding capacity in 2035, given those cash flows, with a very low bus level. I mean, like $7 million a year, not the $40 million, $25 million we've seen before. Obviously, at a much higher bus level, we got much less bonding capacity. Can you, can you give us any sense of what you anticipate the next level of bonding only against these tax revenues? I don't want to talk about extending the tax. I don't want to anticipate anything else. What else can we spend from these more MARTA tax proceeds going forward for projects that are on the bottom of that project list? I, again, it, it, it depends. Uh, depends on how much we use for bus service, enhanced bus service, and streetcar, and what is remaining on that. And also, it's kind of a somewhat premature to talk about that number because we are talking about something starting 2035. Uh, project schedules, costs can change. Sales tax receipts can change. There are a lot of variables there. So for me to just throw out a number now, I think wouldn't be the right thing to do. Well, let me, let me showcase my concern. 
The city's being asked, in essence, to sign up for a list of nine, where we had a list of 17. The city's being asked to sign up for a total cost of 1.9 billion over the next 10 fiscal years. The city is being asked to approve this, and I'm trying to understand what we're crowding out. And frankly, I'm trying to understand if basically this is it. If this is all we're going to get from the more MARTA program from a capital perspective, and in fact, that the project li projects listed at the bottom, the future projects, really don't have much of an opportunity to be funded. That's what I'm trying to figure out. And I don't think it's premature, with all due respect, to say we have no idea when you have put multiple projects down at the bottom that are supposed to come off this, pro this, this uh, revenue list. Just, I just want to address that. We, we are, as Raj said, in terms of 2035, through the, the course of the 40-year program, we are not prepared to stand here and make any promises about tranche two. I have said during the presentation that at 2035, we will be having a conversation with the city of Atlanta and, and mapping out how we fund tranche two. So that is very much our intention. But to, to stand, I, I agree with the CFO to stand here and make that projection today would be, well, certainly irresponsible of us. Well, let me, let me just go on the record that, that having built out the spreadsheet for the rest of the term using basic assumptions, I am concerned that there is not an enormous amount of bonding capacity from these tax revenues specifically, and that we are going to be dependent on operating cash flows and external sources of funds to get to those other nine projects. Two other quick questions. One, last time I asked about a required state audit, we both independently, MARTA, and, and we have uncovered that that's not part of the legislation. It is Correct. not required. I wanted to put that on the record. Is there an audit currently underway of more MARTA? Uh, not, no, I don't, I don't believe there's anything yet because we've been doing a lot of spending. It's been program planning, but we will be auditing as things get rolling. We've been doing a lot of spending on bus operations. We've been doing well, a yeah, lot that's of clear. That's clear. So, but in terms of the projects themselves, they're still in a, at a phase where there's not a lot to audit. I just mean an audit of the more MARTA program, not necessarily the capital. But it's not underway. That's correct. Um, and finally, are you comfortable with the staffing levels that you currently have and that you anticipate being able to hire to deliver this list? Let me preface my question. We know that you've had, everybody's had staffing problems, not exclusive to MARTA. We know it has impacted bus miles. We've talked about that previously in this line of questioning. I have a concern that the timeline may or may not be realistic depending on the staffing levels. Are you as CEO comfortable that we have the staffing levels and the ability to hire to, to fulfill these projects? No. That I think is an ongoing question that we need to, to continue to. Yeah, it's, to, it's, to I mean, we, we've established. I appreciate and, the candor. As, as you said, uh, system wide, country wide, we, staffing is a major concern. So I, I, I will tell you that it's high on our list and we're focused on it. We're doing all of those things. But no, I, I'd be lying if I said we got it locked right now. I appreciate the candor. And I, and I simply would close by saying I think it's imperative, given the size and the scope of this. Um, effort for more MARTA, that we are very, very open about any assumptions, any concerns, any roadblocks along the way, right? And so I appreciate that candor and I look forward to more of it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you and thank you to MARTA for your time today, uh, your willingness to answer uh, a whole bunch of questions. I suspect we will keep you on your toes. We may ask for a work session at some point to dive a little bit deeper for some unanswered questions. but. Um, at the very least, we'll see you in three months for your next quarterly update. Uh, but I, I think there's probably hunger for some additional Q&A uh, before then. So we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Section G, we have a, a public hearing today. I, I failed to mention if, if folks are interested in making public comment for this public hearing item, which is regarding the abandonment of a, a street uh, to sign up. Uh, so I'll pause to see if there's any public comment interest for the public hearing. I will move to move it. Move to go into the public hearing. Second by Juan. Please open the vote. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote?
The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. The public hearing is now open. They got you. They got you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any public comment, Mr. Johnson? No, Mr. Chair. We have no. Right. Can you please read in the item for a public hearing? Item number one, twenty-three zero one 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 one. An ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor as designee, on behalf of the City of Atlanta, to abandon portions of a public street known as North Circle Drive consisting of approximately 0 0.2026 acres lying and being in the land lot, 248 of the 17th District of Fulton County, Georgia, being more specifically described in the attached Exhibit A to LWH Cary Park LLC, authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute a quick claim deed for such abandoned right of way and for other purposes. Mo motion to close the public hearing by Juan, second by Lewis. Please open the vote on the motion to close the public hearing. One moment. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? It's all good. The vote is still open. This is on the uh, motion to close the public hearing. Please vote if you haven't voted yet. Oh, he did second it. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The public hearing is now closed. You're the sixth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to move that we approve this on condition. The condition being that ATL DOT speak with Council Member Hillis, who has yet to um, talk with you all about it. Uh, Second by Norwood, Mr. Wan, do you have comments? Yeah, so I, I'm just curious, what, what's the purpose of the abandonment? I mean, uh, that, that's why I was trying to pull up the legislation to see um, what this is going towards. Good afternoon, this is North South Carolina here at DOT. There's existing uh, a project development to add, this uh, abandonment will add to the project for housing. So there's a motion before us to move forward on condition that the department speak with Council Member Hillis. Uh, second by Norwood. Please open the vote on moving this forward on condition. Vote is open. Vote is closed. The vote is closed. Six J zero nays is item is favorable. This takes us to our consent agenda, item number, section I, ordinance for first reading. Item number two, 2301132, an ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer in fiscal year 2023 to process a reimbursement in the amount of $791,993.00 from the general fund to the Department of Aviation for APD vehicle for higher ATL code enforcement expenses charged for fiscal years 20, 2018 to 2022 to the Department of Aviation 
on the behalf of the general fund and recoveries of those expenses to airport renewal financing and accounting and for other purposes. Item number three, 2301133, and ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer or his designee to amend the fiscal year 2023 general government capital overlay fund budget on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation by transferring impact fee funds to transportation infrastructure projects in the sum of $3,846,028.00 for the purpose of capital and system improvements and for other purposes. Item number four, 2301134, an ordinance by a transportation committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to apply for grant funding from the Georgia Department of Transportation if awarded to accept such funding to enter into any necessary grant agreements to amend the fiscal year 2023 intergovernmental grant fund budget by adding to anticipations and appropriations up to $2 million in zero cents to increase budget amount authorized by the Georgia Department of Transportation for downtown city hall vicinity streets resurfacing project and for other purposes. This takes us to our regular agenda, section K, ordinance for second reading. Item number five, 2301109, an ordinance by Transportation Committee requesting the Chief Financial Officer to authorize the budget transfer in the amount of $430,000.00 from Aviation Renewal and Extension Fund, Department Airport Commercial Properties, Account Professional Services Technical, to Aviation Renewal and Extension Fund, Department Airport Police K-9 Unit, Account Equipment $5,000 plus, and for other purposes. Mr. Bredari, thank you for your patience. The floor is yours. Hired, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Member, BB Udari Aviation General Manager. We currently have one robot and eight bomb suit in order. The costs have gone up for those that we have in order. And also, uh, we have money planned for 2022 budget to order a second bomb robot for, the, um, uh, for our APD officers. I'm moving that forward because of the long lead time. So seeking approval to transfer money to complete those transactions. Motion to approve by Juan, second by Amos. Please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays, item is favorable. Item number six, 2301110, an ordinance by a Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute amendment number one to the project management agreement for the Little Five Points Smart Mobility Improvement Study with the Little Five Points Community Improvement District to extend the term of the agreement for a period not to exceed 1,067 1, days to begin retroactively on February 28th, 2021, giving a new expiration date of January 31st, 2024, with no additional funding required and for other purposes. Mr. Abbas Saud. Good afternoon, Ibrahim Abu Saud, um, uh, Capital Projects of Lana DOT. The, uh, the purpose of this legislation is to execute amendment number one to the uh, uh, project management agreement with the Little Five Point Community Improvement District to extend the expiration date uh, uh, of the Little Five Points uh, Smart Mobility Improvement Study until January 31st, 2024. I'll move to approve, Councilor Juan. Uh, I'm, this is more about a form question. So this ex this contract's been expired for two years. Are we not better off just doing a special procurement or something else? I, I, I don't like the optics on this. Uh, no matter what the, the purpose is, um, it just seems awkward to me. Okay, I can, I can talk about what's the reasons for the delay. Um, if I understand. I, mean, I think we've got the notes on that in terms of this, the scope wasn't anticipated and we're expanding it. Again, I open, but this is more yeah. a form question than anything else. Yeah, we usually, before we decide what, what procurement method we do, we, we talk to a DOP and that's the best option. I'll direct this at law then. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Wan. This is Stephanie Grant from the Law Department. We evaluated this request when it came through our team for legislative approval. The, this is a project management agreement, and so it's my understanding that the um, CID had a bit of an issue um, completing the, um, the scoping study. Um, at this point, the scoping study is already 80% complete, and so they just need a little bit more time to um, evaluate or to finalize the study. And so we did, we did talk about it internally and we, we tossed it up um, 
as far as looking at starting all over from scratch with a new with a new agreement but the CID did um, um, convince ATL DOT that they were 80% complete and they would be finished um, so we do um, we, we do recognize the optics and we we did we did tell them that you would ask <laughs> um, but the, it was the best solution to allow the scoping study to be completed okay. one thing you said that's helpful is that the, the study under the underlying study is still not complete so this going back it makes that a little more palatable um and then there's no uh, the other thing i'll point out is there's no additional funding being applied to this that is that is correct all right thank you i'll second the motion mr Fergie. motion by Fergie, second by Juan. please open the vote And if I may just pause for a second uh, before the votes are finalized, I sit on the little five point CID board by nature of being a council person who oversees that area. Is it a conflict for me to vote on this this paper? I mean, I have no personal or financial benefit in it. I'm just on the board of the CID. To avoid appearance of impropriety, yes. it would be best for you to. Okay, I will withdraw my motion. I'll make, I'll make the motion. Yeah. Uh, motion by Juan, second by uh, Norwood. Please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays, one abstention. This item is favorable. Item number seven, 2301112, an ordinance by Transportation Committee to correct ordinance 2201524. <laughs> adopted by the Atlanta City Council on August 1st, 2022, and approved by the operation of law on August 10th, 2022, by deleting, by deleting in the incorrect funding source and replacing it with the correct funding source and for other purposes. Mr. Abbas, I would. Yes, uh, this, this request came from the grants office, advised that amendment legislation is required to correct the funding source name and the legislation. I'll move to approve. Second by Amos, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero days, the item is favorable. Item number eight is a substitute. Uh, the substitute adds. And the, seat, and the city receiving consent from the Georgia Power Company to hang banners for the Scholars Landing banner project. Uh, motion before the substitute by Juan, a second by Faroki. Please open the vote on the motion to bring forward the substitute. The vote is open. The vote is closed. <laughs> Six J's, zero nays, substitutes before you. Item number eight, 2301119, an ordinance by Councilmember Jason Dozier as substituted by Transportation Committee. A substitute ordinance authorizing the waiver of provisions contained in Chapter 138, Article 2, Division 6, Section 138 60, entitled Flags, Banners, Signs, Displays of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances for any banner permit granted to this Atlanta Housing Authority for the University Choice Neighborhood Placemaking program banners and specifically to waive the banner deposit fee of $1,000.00 pursuant to city code section 138-67 subsection A-87 to waive the banner permit fee of $100.00 pursuant to city code section 138-60 subsection A-8 and to waive all banner per banner and per day fees pursuant to city code sections 138-60 subsection a8 B1 and 138-60 subsection A8 B2 requesting the, the Commission of the Atlanta Department of Transportation to authorize the banners to remain in their right of way for more than 30 days authorizing the mayor or, or their designee to seek the necessary consent from Georgia Power companies to install such banners and for other purposes. Uh, Mr. Kadir, do you want to speak to this item? And just for purposes of folks in the room, the mics have been turned off because that speaker is malfunctioning. But uh, for those of us on the dais and at the podium, the channel 26 feet is still picking up our, our conversation. 
Mr. Kadir. Uh, no, sir. Ah, okay. And it's better. <laughs> Just speak uh, up if you don't mind. Yeah, North of Korea is your DOT. So there is a substitute ordinance, and uh, we are fine with the substitute ordinance. I think the biggest issue is that the biggest thing we address the substitute is uh, speak up. You can't hear. No, speak into the mic because the TV is still picking you up. Oh, okay. So um, traditionally, uh, the waivers hap used to happen with the ATO DOT. We approved that because of the the lease, uh, the, uh, the street light lease we have Georgia, with Georgia Power. We are okay uh, going ahead with this because it stipulates that we have to work with them and we have already started working with Georgia Power. Okay. I'll move to approve. Second. Second by Juan, please open the vote. Please do. Motion, motion to amend by item number 10 by Juan, second by Faroki. Please open the vote. I'll, yeah. Yeah. I'll move to adopt item number 10 as amended. Motion to approve is amended. Second by Norwood. Please open the vote. Please do. I'll move to approve those uh, items for traffic calming devices. Second. Second by Amos. Please open the vote. Mr. Nagy. Perfect. My name is Doug Nagy, Deputy Commissioner of Strategy and Planning. Long time no see, y'all. Uh, this is a resolution uh, asking us to, to do a traffic study uh, for an area that's getting a lot of heavy traffic that doesn't reside, you know, isn't doesn't have a destination or an origin in this area. Yeah, welcome to Atlanta. Uh, yep. Yeah, and uh, so we're, we're we're fine moving forward with this traffic study, and, and and we're working with the Councilwoman's office on it. So that's you know. Motion approved by Norwood. Second by Faroki. Please open the vote. The vote is open. Oh, excuse me. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. The item is favorable. 
Item number 1423R3268, a resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise renewal option number one and supplement a joint, a joint task order fund in the amount not to exceed $7,200,000.00 for the use under two established manager, managing general contractor services contracts at Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport. All services will be charged to and paid from account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Mr. Bedari. BB Adari, Aviation General Manager. This is to um, seek approval to exercise our only renewal option and add money to the task order. Approved by one, second by Amos. Please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. Item is favorable. Item number 1523R3269, a resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise the first renewal option for sole source agreement FC10316, prop work software maintenance and support with Amadeus Airport IT Americas Incorporated on behalf of the Department of Aviation for a term of one year effective July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024, an amount not to exceed 52000 $822.40. All contract work will be charged to and paid from the fund department organization and account number listed herein and for other purposes. Mr. Bedari. This is a five year initial option with five one year renewal options. Uh, we're exercising the first one year renewal option of our property and revenue management billing system. Um, we are also concurrently moving uh, to adopt the your system, so I may not come back for any additional renewal option. Motion to approve by one, second by Davis. Please up. The vote is up. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. This item is favorable. Item number 16, 23R, 3270. A resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute an agreement with Power and Energy Services Incorporated and Taylor Sutton Services Incorporated for contract RFPS 1220373, general, generator, general, generator Maintenance and On-Call Services at Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport on behalf of the Department of Aviation in the amount of $1,050,000.00. All contracted work will be charged to and paid from the council numbers listed herein and for other purposes. And Mr. Chair, this item needs to be amended to attach the IPRO report. Motion to amend to attach the IPRO report. That report was emailed to the committee earlier today. Second by Juan. Please open the vote on the motion to amend to attach the IPRO report. The vote is open. We're moving for it. We're moving uh, favorable as amended. But we're, we're, we're voting on the amendment now. Yeah. Let's close. Six days, zero days. This item has been amended. Mr. Bayadar, do you want to speak to this paper? Sorry, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, this is to um, seeking approval to award uh, um, a contract to two small firms to um, perform operations and maintenance of 31 standby emergency generator. Uh, to augment our commercial power. I'll move to approve. Second by Amos, please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. Item number 17, 23 R, 3271. A resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to execute amendment number one to IFBC 1210246, Cascade Road Avenue Streetscape and signal installation with Matthews Kelly Joint Venture on behalf of the Atlanta Department of Transportation for an additional term 
of 820 days, <laughs> giving a new expiration date on July 5th, 2025, with no additional funding required and for other purposes. Motion to approve by one. Uh, Mr. Abbas, I would if you could speak to it. Ibrahim Abu Saud, Capital Projects, Atlanta DOT. Um, the, this legislation is uh, basically to extend the uh, contract for 820 days, giving the uh, new uh, completion date of uh, July 5th of 2025. Um, we need it this time so the contractor can uh, go back and start to work. He's scheduled to go uh, in August. The utility relocation right now is, is going very well, moving. So basically, we're extending this time so the contractor can start the work. Uh, so motion by Juan, second by Overstreet. Please open the vote. Thank you. The vote is open. Will everyone please vote? The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. Item number 1823R3272, a resolution by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee to exercise renewal option number two for FC 9034 Orange Street Parking Management Program with SB Plus all in one joint venture on behalf of the Department of Transportation for a term of one year effective March 14th, 2023 through March 13th, 2024 and for other purposes. Nagy. Uh, good, good afternoon at this point. Um, Doug Nagy, Deputy Commissioner of Strategy and Planning for Atlanta Department of Transportation. Uh, this, is the, this is a one year and the last renewal uh, for our current parking contract. As I, as I had mentioned previously, the revenue, the service has been pretty good from our, from our standpoint. And then the revenues have not been stable because of the pandemic, and so this will get us uh, more information and, and more confidence with our, you know, bidders uh, in a year from now uh, when we're implementing the next parking contract. Great. Motion approved by Juan, second by Faroki. Please open the vote. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Four yeas, one nay. This item is favorable. Item number 19, 23R3273, a resolution by Transportation Committee to fund the West Curb Improvement Project component for project number FC9277, Plain Train Tunnel West Extension Phase 1 Progressive Design Build at Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport with Clark Atkinson Technique, a joint venture comprised of Clark Construction Group LLC. Atkinson Construction and Technique Con Concrete Construction LLC for the funding to complete the West Curb area and amount not to exceed $15 million and zero cents for, contract serv for construction services and extend the term of the agreement for two years in accordance with Section 2-1163 solicitations or awards in violation of law, Subsection C remedies after award of Article 10 of Procurement of and Real Estate Code of the City of Atlanta Code of Ordinances and all contract work will be charged to and paid from the council members solicited here and for other purposes. Mr. Bayadari. So all our construction, this is a little bit complex, if you give me a minute. So all our construction project range from simple to very complex. This current um, plane train extension is the most complex. And I think this is the first time since I've been at the airport, we are using a delivery method called design bid built because of the complexity nature and all the unknowns that uh, are occurring there. Uh, this request is to seek approval for, uh, for, for two elements. Number one, a scheduled variance to add two more years to this very specialized construction project. And so that's the first ask is a two-year variance. And the second is to add $15 million, which is within our budget program element uh, to this project. So I'm not seeking approval for any additional money to this overall project. We're well within budget. It's just to add 
the two years variance to complete the rest of the elements that are there. And there are a number of reasons, if you would like to hear those reasons why. Motion approved by Juan. <clears throat> Excuse me, second by Amos. Please open the vote. Vote is open. Vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable. I think we have one more paper. Then. Yeah. Uh, I think we have one paper coming up held today. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Item number 31, 1721 an ordinance by Transportation Committee authorizing the mayor or his designee on behalf of the city of Atlanta to execute a quick claim deed of, to city of College Park to convey text parcel 14-192-1-6-5 located on Red Wine Road, College Park, Georgia to execute a quick claim deed to College Park to convey tax parcels IDs as listed located on the south side of Harvard Avenue in College Park, Georgia and to accept a, a quick claim deed from the College Park Business Industrial Development Authority conveying tax parcels as listed herein located on the north side of Harvard Avenue in College Park, Georgia to the city for the purpose of consummating the transactions authorized by ordinance 12-0-55 and for other purposes. And I will move to hold this paper. Oh, excuse me, file this paper, file, motion to file. Uh, second by Juan. Please open the vote on the motion to file. The vote is open. The vote is closed, five yeas, zero nays. This item is favorable. It's not, it was followed by committee, excuse me. Before we close today, I want to recognize Councilmember Norwood. Yes, I just want to say two or three things for the record. Number one, I do want the update on the Moores Mill West Wesley intersection improvement. Um, it was bid with the extra lane and it came in too high, so it's in limbo. I have asked that it, we understand what a bid is without the extra lane, which is what I've asked for for a year, because uh, that project is left over from 2015. Mm -hmm. District 8 got precious little in 2015. I won't belabor that, but surely we can get this project done before we start doing all of the 2022. Number two, that we will have before us next week uh, uh, legislation 23-0-1133, which is impact fees. Uh, three of those are for complete streets. One is a multi-purpose path. One's an intersection. One's a pedestrian mobility. Uh, my question is, what are those impact fees specifically going to be used for? Because I've understood that you can't use an impact fee except to enhance capacity. So I would like to know what part of these projects are going to have impact fees and exactly what those impact fees are going to be doing. Um, the last thing on impact fees is I have requested, and I'm requesting again, that we, uh, we get a new category of streets, commuter streets, that are not state roads, but have the bulk of our commuter traffic. I have many of those in Northwest Atlanta. A Councilwoman Overstreet has many of those in Southwest Atlanta, where they are not state roads, but our roads are falling apart. So I would like to get that uh, before, the, before ATL, DOT, and the city's law department because I believe that we, as the capital city, having the greatest influx of commuters coming into our city can get some of these streets fixed. Because as we all know, LMIG funding doesn't go far enough. And we've got a huge list uh, for 2023 of LMIG. And so for this council to come up with a new policy where we can get streets rebuilt when they have fallen apart rather than just resurfaced. So that is my request of the law department, the administration, and the transportation department. Thank you, Councilor Norwood. Uh, thank you to the committee for your hard work today. Thank you to everyone who stuck this out for three plus hours, especially our chief procurement officer who didn't have a role to play. I'll take that to mean that the procurement office is still hard at work uh, moving our projects through. But gold stars to everyone. Thank you. Uh, we are adjourned.